Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, um, it's a pleasure to actually uh, um, welcome Michael Doherty here to um, uh, Microsoft Research to give a talk about the Cube. Uh, which is a large display at um, QT, and it'd be actually great to uh, hear where there's opportunities for not only Microsoft, Microsoft Research, also to collaborate within with this great uh, kind of technical asset that's available. So, thank you. Well, thanks for the brief intro. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, yes, my name is Michael Doherty. I'm from QUT, Queensland University of Technology, um, in Brisbane, Australia. And we have this amazing bit of kit for large-scale visualization, which is called the Cube. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is just to uh, do a bit of show and tell, all these few things we've got going there, uh, talk about uh, how we did it briefly, talk about some of the content projects we have there already, talk about where we want to go, and also end with a few what I think are the major research questions for this area, and hopefully that'll engender some interest. Uh, so this was a project that started some years ago. Our Vice Chancellor very keen and um, his intention about uh, the, show, the Cube to showcase uh, science and technology. A uh, whole new building, uh, around the $300 million mark. It's a great building to work in for researchers, but it has a very important task, which is to inspire new students to be engaged with science and to some extent research. And that's, a, of course, a problem worldwide is getting... Uh, uh, students interested in science. <coughs> so the cube, it was called the cube because the very earliest ideas was literally for it to be a cube going running over two stories and you had the four panels either side each story and eight panels and you could then go inside of it which was, an, which was a common idea for an immersive space. There's a whole lot of reasons why we didn't go ahead with that. It eventually become, became two sides of that cube so this was the, the final design. That's a two-story space, lots of projectors, lots of touch screens. On the other side of it is a one-story space with, again, projectors and touch screens. And then above that, again, two more spaces, some with screens, some with just projectors. And I'll show you, this was the original design that went forward with the, the people who had developed the, it, it physically. This also, I found recently, is an old sketch of when we were having an elaborate uh, discussion, some would say argument, about what we were going to do in terms of the technology. And, and, and I can assure you there was a great deal of discussion about what should be there. Broadly, uh, we've got some fairly interesting kit um, to do with uh, what controls each one of the panels. And I'll go through this in more detail later in the talk. But I just thought I'd like to show you that, that uh, there's a, lots of bits and pieces and lots of fairly uh, sophisticated background processing behind it all. This was a more developed uh, image of the final design and it looks realistic but is in fact a CAD model of, of the design. So the, the building that was to be there uh, was very elaborately designed to make sure it was going to be what we wanted. This is in the process of building it and you can see bits and pieces, lots of kit, uh, lots of frames. This is uh, the spot where all the touch panels were placed and you can see the brackets there so they're designed so that we can put them in and take them out again as needed for maintenance and so on. You can also see there's a fair bit behind and you can walk in behind the, uh, the uh, system. And this is how it is today. This is in fact an image of the cube. You can see the project there which I'll talk some more about which is the virtual reef. Um, you can see the stairs, you can see someone standing at level five. It's a two-story space with a lot of projection. Equally around the other side, uh, the one-story space and there's a project there called the Physics Playroom, which I'll go into more detail. Uh, the other side again, another project, this is called the History Wall or the Data Wall and this is geolocated data placed and in this case the first project was our um, information about the flood that we had in our city two years ago which uh, took out the CBD. Upstairs, the four panels, there's usually lots more going on there, but this is where students and other people can try out touch events and so on. There's a couple of games running there, as you can see. 
and the final space which has a number of projectors which can be blended or separately run and uh, there's some seats on the left and people can plug in their computer and use that space as they wish. Another important point is um, that this is a public space. So here's the entrance to the Science uh, and, uh, and Engineering Centre and you can see the physics uh, play space there, the, the, the bottom level, first level uh, of the uh, cube. And it is very much a public space and it's very much a space that people uh, see as they enter. And of course we have a lot of visitors, we have about 12,000 a month. Is that front to back, so is on the other side, is that the, the large? On the other side is the large display, okay. yes. So this is just showing that as you come in the door you see it, people walk up to it and start touching and playing with it, and of course going around is the reef. So we named these spaces zone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, just out of interest some details there, it's two storey high as you can see, 20 multi-touch panels, 10 each side of the, the wedge space, large projectors, high lumens, they're 3D capable although we don't have a project that uses them at the moment. For the virtual reef which is on this side we're using a, 2D, a 3D game engine called Talk but we're moving over to Unity soon. Runs across multiple screens and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, it interprets touches into that um, and there's also info panel content which I'll show you. The audio, there is a big woofer system behind the, the wedge. Uh, there are ambient speakers hung about inside and there are also individual um, projectors under each panel so that you can have localised sound when you touch the walls. Coming around you get uh, zone 3 and 4, this is still on the bottom level. Now we've got 12 of these panels across the bottom, you can see the resolution there. Got the three projectors which blend across the top. We've got the loudspeakers and we've got RFID readers which allows you to come in and swipe your st staff card and then you have access to putting your information up onto this display space. And I'll show you some of that. USB connectors under each panel which allows us to do anything else you want. Going up at the top we call it zone 5 and zone 6. So zone 5 has got the four panels. Uh, two speakers blended and the audio and the RFID and on the other side it's the projector space. So we, we designed specifically a range of different types of uh, projection and display space to allow us to explore things and so this upper level tends to be where we try out things or where students put up their projects. This is an old sketch that goes, uh, as I said, that goes way back um, and I just thought I'd go through some of the tech that's around it. So essentially we've got two panels and a, uh, and a, a, C a CPU or a, a PC rather per two panels, two CPUs, two uh, graphic cards, a lot of capability and we can run each panel as a separate high definition space or a blended double space. You can see we've got a fair bit of storage there both in RAM and SSD as well as um, hard disk space so that local applications can have a blend of what's there and what's not there. And depending on what application we use, so for example the uh, Reef has a server, dedicated server which keeps uh, control of the state of the Reef and it keeps track of where everything is and then sends that information back to the local processes for, for actual um, visualisation and rendering. The other, some of the other applications we have there do things differently. They either have a local server or a, using the, the um, local PC as a server. <coughs> so, as, I, as that diagram uh, suggested, uh, we've got uh, across those spaces 54 high definition displays. We have the GTX 680 cards, which are fairly advanced for the, we've probably got another year or so in those, and uh, SLI across the, uh, that in order to speed up processing. We went out to tender we, with SGI, Dell and HP and SGI uh, were very keen and uh, did a lot to make sure that they uh, come up to our specifications. It's essentially a Windows box but running all of that kit there as you can see um, and using some fairly high end graphics cards. One of the reasons for doing this is again for future proofing so we can take out the um, the 690 uh, and put in the 790 when it's available and get all the resources we need there. So we try to keep it 
future-proof and over spec as long as we can continue to fund that so that there's no limitation on what you can do. We have a number of servers, yes, only Win 7, but that seems to work. We've got a Linux, Linux server, there's a backup there, which really is just really command and control. The Win 7 servers take care of the state of the system and also look, look after the projectors. 64 CPUs all up. <coughs> um, small supercomputer, and it is possible to have all of them doing one thing at one time if, if you really wanted to do that through the Linux system. There's three independent networks there uh, running across uh, so that we can have external things brought in, such as, say, Google Maps or Worldwide Telescope. Uh, we also have internal stuff, which is the QT network, and that's where we use the ability to bring up your own information from your own file system. And we have a dedicated server just to handle all the touch events running back and forth. We were a little concerned when we were designing this and <clears throat> by the time we got it together and were able to test it and then we loaded the system up to its maximum and the, uh, the data was showing 0.95 um, so, uh, <coughs> network use and we started to get a little bit worried and we overstressed it and it went out to uh, 1.2 and we realised it was 1.2 per cent not 0.95 per cent of the system. So we, were, we have not yet got anywhere, anywhere near 3 per cent load where we uh, in the network. So there's plenty of room for more data. And in fact, that's what we're trying to do is use this for very large data. Quickly there, depending on the projects, and I'll go through those in a moment. A bunch of uh, kit there, of course. Node.js is coming to the fore. JavaScript is the thing we mostly use, but there are some other tools there. Um, extempore uh, is the language that one of our people, Andrew Sorensen, wrote for the physics playroom, and I'll talk about that some more, mainly in order to allow the physics to go on seamlessly, but also the networking, and I'll talk about that when we show it. Another important point to make is it's not actually touch panels, it's infrared or computer vision. Those panels that you see are not responding to pressure, to touch, they're actually responding to seeing you. And we can calibrate that differently depending on the application and you could actually uh, use it to pick up, uh, they can, it can pick up a body uh, at about uh, 30 centimetres or just over a foot. So you could use it to know if someone was standing in front of a screen and do other things without people actually touching the screen. We haven't done that yet, but it is possible. Uh, Behind each of those panels are 32 infrared cameras that track fingers and hands through image processing. Uh, we haven't yet got to any limit to that. The important thing about this is that you can have multiple hands and that was what it was about, that kids, students, whatever, you can have two or three people or more on the same panel at the same time. We, to test the system, we had it uh, hammered at 100 touch uh, events per second for 14 hours and it, the systems were still running quite well, so. <coughs> so now, sorry? No, the, so this, uh, these panels come from a Finnish company called Multitaction. They have a branch here in the US. Um, we were one of their first customers because this goes back a few years. And the version that we got with the 32 cameras is the fourth version of the technology and the, with the ultra thin bevel, which is just under two mils so that uh, you can stack them together. Um, the first version of this, when we first started playing with, it had two cameras, then four, then eight, then they jumped to 32. The reason why you want so many cameras is, is for that blend area as, you, as your fingers move across a spot between cameras so that it's seamless and accurate. It also allows for this public event because the panels themselves, the external screens are just plastic. Doesn't matter if you scratch them or they're damaged. They are very hard and they don't scratch at all easily. Uh, but it means you can just be replaced and put back and you're not paying a lot of money for that. So it's not touch, which in a, a public space is important. And they're very accurate and you can configure the sensitivity of where it picks up an image. So we, we configure ours to be just on that millimetre above the surface of the, of the screen to, to register a touch event. So the touch is really um, computed on, a, on your server touch, on the touch server, right? Does yeah, so we've got a... We've got a, uh, one of the networks takes all these touch events and depending on the application, so it registers the touch events, which is essentially just an XY, 
uh, and depending on what your application wants to do with it. So you get the raw data, it goes to the touch server using TUIO um, protocols. And then depending on your application, we'll take that information and do with it what you want to do for your application. So we, we if you like, process that separately so the application is not trying to deal with all of that as well. So if you've got a lot of redundant things or people doing things that don't mean anything to your application, they're going to be essentially ignored. But the touch server is monitoring everything. So I'll just talk about uh, the application. So the first one I'll talk about is called the physics playroom. So there is this link and, and these uh, slides are available. So if you have a look at that uh, Vimeo, you'll, you'll see this in action. I don't have time to show you now, I don't think. Uh, that's Andrew standing there. You can see the scale of it. <coughs> What's interesting is you've got this 3D world. It's supposed to be a Renaissance scientific laboratory. This application shows the first 13 chapters of physics, university physics textbook. It's got everything from Newtonian physics through to fluid dynamics, through to optics, through um, audio pulse generators and, and so on. It's all there. There are info panels that you can bring up uh, across it to explain all of that. What you're seeing there is, uh, is just the gravity turned to one of the, the Pluto, I think. So all the blocks start to float. If you choose another planet, which is simply done on a, a, a medieval ossuary there, uh, boom, they all drop to the ground. If you, if you make them Plu uh, Satan or something, they're very heavy to move. Uh, on normal gravity, you can <clears throat> touch one of those blocks, you can lift them up and you can build things, make blocks so that kids can do that. Or interestingly, you can flick a block from one side to the other. Each two panels there is one PC <clears throat> and across the top are three projectors all run by a separate PC. So that means when you pick up a block on the left and just lift it and flick it across, it will go all the way across to the other side. So you could actually have a tennis game um, what is interesting is it's running across a number of machines seamlessly and one of the things Andrew did was to write the software so that could happen. So the physics would be correct but also the networking and he does that through time synchronization not through normal network synchronization pulses. And part of the reason he does it is because his earlier work was on music um, software, live performance, live coding um, and uh, so this thing about timing was something that he's uh, very much involved in and, that, and this is what uh, his PhD was about. He teaches compiler design and admonishes students for not understanding what he's talking about. Uh, fluid dynamics is there. There's a couple of portraits of famous people and you can fiddle around with that. There's also a fireplace and you can play with that and so on. Um, the other project is called Qubit. And this is about where you can come up and interact with your own information. So you can swipe your staff card. It comes up with a little panel which is your file system if you like. You can have uh, images, text, PowerPoints and videos in that. From the little panel that's sitting in front of you, drag it off of your panel into, onto the screen space and then it is there for you to resize, to manipulate, to shift across. You can throw it across, move it across. Uh, you can take it over and put it on someone else's um, directory space and then it's transferred to them. You can also lift it up and put it to the top band of the touch panels there and then it automatically gets taken into the projector space and is projected. If it's a video, it goes full size and the audio comes up. If it's a PowerPoint, it goes into PowerPoint pr presentation mode and then you just simply flick your hand against the touch panels and it'll flick through um, each of the, each of the um, slides of the presentation. So it's meant, uh, as you can see here, this is a poster display from a conference we had there. So We've used it a couple of times for conferences in this space, so people come in and when they're registered they get a, a temporary swipe card and their conference information is, is up there and the, all the conference uh, uh, presentations are there. So instead of giving them a, a, a book or whatever, this is what we give them. Uh, so it's, we've had some interest in that in a general sense. Uh, this is also a poster display of that conference. This application can go on any of the zones of the cube just as any of the other projects can. So in this case uh, a number of people, again there's I think the limitation is about 20 people at once can have their information up there. You drag and drop, you just drag it onto the display space, you can resize, you can turn, you whatever. And again if you flick it up it just goes onto the full projection. One of the other projects called the history wall or the data wall and this is a project where geolocated images. So 
in this case we decided to play with the story of the flood of Brisbane some years ago, two, two and a half years ago. A large part of Brisbane was flooded. This is a, a also a, called sometimes called the community wall because you can go to a website, upload your images, a bit of moderation, and then they're geo-tagged and then they come up. So you can come into here, go to your interest area, touch on the, the space and up will come your image that you put up. And so this is an opportunity for us to capture all that information that, that thousands of people took images of during the flood and it's not lost and so it becomes into a public environment. And what you're seeing here is a few explorations of that interface in terms of time and <coughs> how we wanted to present the information. It also accepts video um, and various explorations. This is the current interface, you can't quite see that text. Because of the way this space is, and this is where we get into the questions of interaction, so with the reef, um, which I'll show you in a moment, it's a seamless space, but with, and with the physics playroom, it's a seamless space between the touch panels and the projection. In this case, it's not, and with Qubit, it's not. So here, if no one is there, then this resides back to a, an image of the, of the river running across the bottom, it's a long river. When you come up to each one of these panels, then as you touch it, it then becomes, it separates from the others and it becomes yours and you can change the scale and manipulate and do whatever you like. As you walk away and after a minute of no activity, it'll just sink back into and blend in with the rest of the, the residing image. So in all of these sort of uh, display spaces, you have this issue of what to do when there's one or five or ten people and when someone is close or not close to the screens. What, how do you deal with those different times and in different environments? And that's some of the questions we're trying to address with the Worldwide Telescope Project. So the Virtual Reef, uh, which is the large project that's in the, the inside, the wedge, which is the project that I was mostly involved with. And uh, as you can see, it's got some sense of scale. And when you're at the upper level looking down, because all of the species in there are built to actual scale, so when the whale comes in, it is a 12 metre whale and so on, and you do get that sense of scale. It's, it is correct size. Mostly people interact at this level. Between the projection and the touch panels, it's a seamless blend. So as a, as a fish wanders across from the projection space into the touch space, there's no sense that they're, they're not continuous. There are 54 fish species here, there are 17 different coral species. Um, the fish species are all uh, AI uh, with behaviours, so the little fish run away from the bigger fish and so on. Uh, despite us programming it, we weren't allowed to have the sharks eating things. It was decided that that was inappropriate for some reason. Um, the manta rays come in and do their dance that they do. They do a very graceful spiral dance they do to, co to collect fish and so on, so we have that. Whale comes in, there's some calves, um, a mother and calf sort of activity. We've got a boat that comes in the top and a diver comes off and so on. Most of these are fairly uh, prescribed behaviours because there's nothing to make, the whales don't move out of the way for anybody and, and so on, but it's all, is all still AI. Fairly good resolution as you get up closer. If you come in close and you touch one of the fish for more, for more than half a second, then you, you grab it, you collect it into your little space here. That image that you see in the middle, you can rotate and flip around and so on, so you can have a look at these things. And if you touch the eye at the bottom, then you get an information panel like this, which is a, which is a web Chrome browser. Um, and you can see the um, top right, you can snap that onto your iPhone or your uh, smartphone and it'll take you to that website with that information and more information and this is how we connect with schools so they can connect into that and uh, into that website and add information and do things to relate to the curriculum. These info panels have got images of the, the fish, sometimes they have videos and so on so there's quite a lot that we can do there. So this is this question of the near and far, so the far you're standing back, you're looking at this amazing reef, uh, I mean we do have whale song and the whales come in and and so on. Localise when you're touching these things you get the audio feedback that you've done something and so on. Um, but, this, but this question of when people are standing close they've got their own little environment and they can do their own information seeking uh, and standing back um, see what it is. 
So our question is, what other 3D worlds, what else would you do? So in an environment like this, you've got a problem when it's this sort of scale. What would you put up there? Uh, in the original project discussion, uh, the, there were five projects thought about. One was the virtual reef. Another was a desert landscape. That has a lot of, it's big, but it has life at, at, at dusk and at night. And so that was a, a consideration. We were going to do space, stars. We were going to do mountains and the Snowy Mountain Scheme, which is a large project in Australia where we turned the coastal rivers, rivers back into the inland. And uh, there was a prehistoric forest, you know, the oh, classic dinosaur exercise uh, that was going to be developed. We ended up going with the virtual reef for various reasons, not unusually because it's also iconic of Australia and Queensland. But we still have this question, what, are, what else are we going to put up there? Well, very luckily, uh, we're working with you guys uh, on the Worldwide Telescope. It seems to be an ideal project because you've already done all the content for us. When we were developing the reef, there was a lot of time and money spent on, on making all those AI creatures. All the, they all had to be modelled, they all had to be rigged, they all had to be textured, they all had to be given behaviours. It took a lot of time, as did the environment, all the, the coral and so on. It took a lot of uh, actual just physical building time. So we've got this wonderful content. Um, the issue is the interaction. So this is how it is for your web interface. The question becomes, an obvious question is, how do we get that up into that space where you've not only got the interactions all down the bottom, but you've got this problem that you might have one person, five people, 10, 50 people. You've got school groups and so on. And how do you interact with this environment at that near or far scale? It's not appropriate for one person to be coming up and touching the panels and controlling all of this all of the time. And how do you restrict that in some realistic way? So we have some ideas. Um, the first one is of course Vanilla Sky and what that will be is simply taking what you've already got there, top and bottom, and putting it all down the bottom. So putting it across at those panels and giving those same sort of icons there for choosing a tour or choosing a location um, and running it all along the bottom. The difference is that when you touch one of those, it's selected, it'll grey out and it's going to play. But someone else could touch another panel immediately afterwards and you can't have it switching between. So implementing what I've called a jukebox model, which is they sync up, line up. So when you touch your panel, it goes grey, yes, that's going to be listed to go and it comes back with a number saying when it's coming up and then we'll just run it through that sort of process. So that means the near and far interaction is you come up close, you, you stand back, you see what you want, you go there, you choose that, you're going to go to Mercury or whatever, and then you're going to step back and watch it. Yep. That raises the question, how iterative does your design process? So like, I, I'd be interested to see if you actually do what you don't want to do, like you let people actually start the new thing the touch, like how do you, it'd be interesting to see if like if people create, you know, can you give feedback to people know this is not acceptable because somebody is, something is happening, or do you need to actually force them not to do that and have the queue model? How, how much in hmm. the way you, you design those things do you account for, okay, we need to learn how people are going to interact with this and then we need to change how it behaves um, to evolve this? Interesting question. I mean, we could explore that. At the moment, the, the model that's going to be implemented is almost done is that uh, you, you simply come across, you choose one, it then grays out not to be chosen again for a moment and it's synced up in, a, in a, this queued model. And that's what we're going with at the moment. It would be interesting to turn that off and to see how people behave. I do think because we get school groups through um, that no amount of, at the moment you say don't, you know, everybody press everything at once, it's exactly what they will do. We don't know how the system would respond actually if you I think, I'm not sure, but if you click, 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 what does it do? Does it just take the last click? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, it'll jump from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the queuing wouldn't be long because if you've got a lot of things queued up, every time you, it zooms off to that location and then it would, so we have to explore that. How long do we let it do that? Do we let it sit at a location at an at a end of a, a choice for some moments? We, I think we have to experiment with that. We do have some ideas about what do you do when there's nobody particularly interacting with it. So, so we'll have some, some you know, slow tours running and things like that. So you, there's a whole lot 
to think about in terms of what do you do when people are just standing back? You know, do you have a planetarium model? The next version, there's two, three stages of this. The first stage is what I've called Vanilla Sky, which is, is this sort of idea, and the, and the jukebox queue of choices. Second one is called the Solar Sky, which is similar to this, but it's because of our need to talk to students. And it'll have the solar system sort of locked in as your choices. <clears throat> and across the bottom panels will be each of the planets doubled up across the 10 there, 10 there, although the, the the two inner ones right in the middle of the, in the, uh, the focus of the wedge will not be active because people can't really stand there. And the students then inquire about the planets and get information about it, including the sun, because it's part of their year 12 or their K-12 curriculum. And so we'll, we'll turn that on when, when the school groups are coming in, if that's what they want. <clears throat> and the third area is the, is the tours and that will be, in a sense, default tours running anyway, but the choice will be for people to select one of the many tours that are already in there and, as we've talked about today, to actually evolve a way where they can make their own tours. And this will be an interesting exercise because it has to be done at that touch, simple gesture level, so we've got to explore that and we've already come a long way today looking at how we can possibly do that. And then after that, we're looking at gestures. So we're looking forward to getting the new connects where we can uh, get the information we want because I want to explore not just one person standing back but a bunch of people and have the idea that if half a dozen or more people start doing a particular gesture uh, the system is going to recognize that and then say right you can you now you can control it and so if you all sway your arms at the right way you know the crowd surfing type thing or the uh, football crowd wave then then it'll move you know you can con so I'm trying to make a bit of a game out of it but it requires cooperation <coughs> And I think that'll work well with the students. I hope it will. So that's where we are at the moment with this, with this project. But really what it's trying to do is demonstrate the potential for this uh, facility to look at this question of large-scale displays and also large-scale data. So the research <coughs> we're doing, so we've got this wonderful kit, all about $5 million worth. It's there to illustrate and to show off and to inspire people with science. We have some other projects like groundwater display project that is available there um, and so on where and we've got the uh, genome genome visualization project so that, and we've got a chemistry project so there's lots of interesting visualizations of scientific knowledge and we also have a lot of high resolution images that people take of you know microbes and so on and the eyes of beast, little beasties and so on and put them up there so we have all this sort of stuff but how do you get people to engage with it and be excited by it. So with the reef, we, we will evolve to a point where people can do a little bit of experimentation themselves, you know, play with a transect line, play with a microscope or a magnifying glass, try and do a little bit of what a real scientist would do and have the model where they can collect and select information and put it onto their own, they open up their own bag and they can put samples in and when they go home, they, the website, they, can, they get it and they can play with it on their computer or in their class. So there's some ideas there about how you actually learn through discovery rather than through a more didactic process, which we've got at the moment. I have to say we went for the more didactic process because um, uh, um, interesting. Um, because that's where the teachers wanted to go because they were safer with it. And I can't get that off the screen. Sorry? Bottom right, ah, they're done. Oh, I can't get a cursor, that's the trouble. Oh. Nobody sees a cursor. Sorry? Press return. Press return? Oh, no. Um, I might have to escape out of that and... There, there we go. There we go, it's all right. Um, so, yes, so the, so the other question is, is having done all these things and got that impressive kit and some impressive applications and, and the Worldwide Telescope is going to be a great one as well, what else do we do with it? So the question that we're looking at is what visualisation processes are most useful for displaying large amounts of data in a way that allows meaningful discoveries? So with the genome project, we've got a lot of, there's some tools out there such as BLAST and Trindif, which allow you to visualise genomic data. 
But the people who use this sort of stuff are used to looking at fairly bland ways of looking at data and visualising data is the real core of the problem because we've got so much of it, we're drowning in it, we've got to be able to visualise it in ways that make sense to humans, get the computer to do what that do it does well and to let us do what we can do well which is to see patterns and um, connections, networks. So this is what we're trying to do with the project. These are the research questions that we are considering. We've got a number of uh, students, PhD students mostly, looking at some of these questions. Um, and we hope to um, develop these connections with, with you guys as, 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 as we can. So that's really my talk. Are there any more questions? No? Thanks. Sorry for showing yeah. you a little bit late. That's all right. Uh, maybe you already covered it, but I, I have a couple of questions. Um, mm. Are you using a commercial game engine for authoring some of these things, or are you rolling your own? And okay, so for the uh, virtual reef, we use the Talk 3D engine to start with. We are evolving it, all those assets over to um, Unity because okay. it's more flexible for what we want to do. It also makes it more accessible for the students because all of my students can do stuff with Unity, but not with Talk. The uh, Physics Playroom is the other 3D world. Uh, Andrew wrote his own 3D visualisation. Well, I imagine it's a bit of code that's available that's pretty simple these days. So that one wasn't commercial. That's, I mean, Extempore will be made available. I think it is through the Australian National University where he did his PhD. Um, but it's probably not easily accessible because I'm sure he hasn't documented it. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the other question that I had, is there... Some, some of the visualizations are inherently 3D. In other words, they have a perspective, so mm. that implies that you probably have a sweet spot. How big is your sweet spot, and do people complain about it? Do okay, you, so that, that's... A particular okay, I, I skipped over that one a little bit, but you're absolutely right. So for the, for the reef, you had this problem that you can't just have one viewpoint because it's not going to look right when you move around. And we did spend a lot of time <laughs> playing with exactly that problem. So the way the reef works is that you've got one state of that 3D world which is on the server and it keeps track of where everything is and what they're doing and it then sends and the touch information goes through to it and then it sends it all back to the individual PC that's running the, either the, a pair of pa uh, two screens or one of the projectors. And then it's locally rendered, the information is then locally rendered. So as a fish swims from one panel to the other it's literally going from one computer to the other or into the projection space and back out again. In order to do that, so with the, one of the reasons we used Talk in the beginning was because we needed to be able to manipulate the code as open source. In order, so each one of those two panels or each one of the projectors is a portal into that particular part of that 3D world and it's all blended. And we've got very subtle variations in the viewpoint of <laughs> each one of those portals so that the, when you're there you don't feel that you're, the perspective is wrong. You actually feel when you walk around that space that it, you're just looking in, into this, into this uh, world, this reef, through a big, big glass panel. But yes, it was, a, it was an interesting question of how to do that. How does the... You can only assume a certain perspective there. <laughs> well, we send the information to the projector from the, the state machine, which is keeping track of the whole 3D world. Sure. And we just, we, we change the, the viewport that goes to each of them just subtly so that the net result to you as you're standing there as it looks okay. If we'd had just one, uh, say, vision point from centred out and then, we, and then we, ge and we generated the 3D world from that and then gave each piece of that to all the projectors, you actually get a, a sense sometimes that things are not quite right. So we actually adjust our viewpoints, spread them out a little bit. You have to go and check <laughs> out yourself to the filter. Filter. But there is, there is multiple viewports. Uh, um, camera positions, if you like. Uh, Are they aligned with the projector, or so, sort of in between? Well, we, no, no. The, the 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 highest projector's viewpoint's a little bit down yeah, below it. Okay. Yeah. So that you know, when you're looking up, it looks right. Okay. Particularly because you've got movement. If it was yeah. static, it would be easier. But when the whales come in, because they're very big, sunfish or the whale shark comes in, they're very large, and so. I mean, the, just just yeah. math. Uh, yeah. if, if you're going to have thing going from one screen to the other screen, mm. 
and if they are aligning, if they are aligned, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're assuming a certain perspective. These are perspective renderings, I presume. Yep. You, you're, you're rendering perspective. That enforces that you have one viewpoint, right? So you have to have, you have to pick somewhere in your room, in your environment, in the 3D mm -hmm. space. You're going to have to pick a location where the, where this scene is rendered from. I, I understand the, the whole mm -hmm. distribu distribution mm -hmm. of it, but like, where do you, I mean, logically, you're kind of picking it in the middle, I guess. Which, which would also mean that anywhere other than that location is going to be slightly off and more slightly off the further you are from that particular location. Okay, so the, the, the core um, server that's holding the state of that holding yeah. does, doesn't do any rendering. What it does know is where all the fish are. And it sends that information to each PC, which then does its own rendering of that particular 3D world with this particular window into it. Sure. So, so we... we but so, from what perspective? I guess what I'm asking from yeah. perspective. Maybe we can take this offline. Yeah, so, but it is slightly different each time, uh, just slightly. It's not, it's not all rendered. So we don't have, because it's all different machines, we don't actually have to render it from one viewpoint. Each, to, each machine is doing its own. So there are um, but, but you do, 14 you different wanna, versions. If, if the whale coming from one end yeah. needs to exactly connect to the, the whale running to the other one, mm. then they need, to, they need to have a shared viewpoint between the two, or very close. Well, they, ha they have a shared state, but as they move between, the viewpoint is only subtly different and, you, and it looks perfectly natural. Because of the bezel or...? It, 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 only if they're really, really close by. Yeah, they you are. You can't have a viewpoint on one side of the room. No, 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 no nothing like that. Whales are going to look... No, 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 nothing, nothing that major. It's, it's very small in real, in, you know, a span of about a metre in real terms if you were standing back. Right, and I'm asking, where's that one meter? Where's that point? In your it's it's a it's about midway back, yeah. But we, 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 we basically spread things out a little bit so that when you're well, standing to two the two questions here. Yeah. Think, one, are you talking about the actual panels at this point, or actually the large displays? So the projected ones. Well, all of this, they're oh, all the, okay. They're all the, they all have a uh, they all each PC gives sends off its yeah. view of the world. Um, the image is blended. But its view of the world is not taken from exactly the same camera point for each yeah. PC. It's, it's, it's spread out a little bit, about a meter yeah, okay. in real terms. Yeah. For instance, if you look at the, at the well, there will be a sweet spot somewhere where it looks great, but when you get close to the screen, and you physically have to move back to have the right perspective because of that. No, so no. if you go back to the image of the, 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 the reef one, yeah. I there's a big one. Trust me, it's magic. <laughs> um, so there's a side view, um, there's looking there, uh, that's looking down. I, I, I've never noticed any odd sense that it's out of perspective. Um, oh, that one's, uh, the other one's there. So uh, we did experiment with it a lot. And the, one of the programmers uh, who spent an awful lot of time and an awful lot of argument with me about this uh, just sorted it out basically. You might, you might actually see a phenomenon here which is really interesting. It, the, the, the theme that you have here has an Im, immense amount of blur from anywhere that's not really in the screen space. So as soon as you're depicting something that's more than a meter or a couple meters in virtual space behind the screen, it's romantically so blurred because it's water, you're looking yes, for water. Yes, that's right. So therefore, your approach that you're applying here to the reef is not going to work for the stars, for example. No, no. And there you will see this problem much, much more than you have here in the reef, which is basically blurring everything that's not really right next to Okay, the so with the Worldwide Telescope, we've already experimented with this. We, we put it up in that space, and as far as we can tell, without any tricks other than the pr uh, projector blending, it looks fine. What we're really doing there is putting the normal one window across the four projectors above. And in the testing we've done, it seems to look fine. Maybe it's just the scale. Um, even when we've done zoomed into planets and we've done the, you know, got the Earth in the middle there, and we sort of looked at that, we've zoomed in, it seems to be fine. The, the stars is it's going to be okay because it's really like a, just a 2D, yeah. Yeah. Just a 2D experience. Yeah. It, it's the 3D things like a planet or a building. building. Yeah, well, it'll be well, in, interesting you, to see. What you should be noticing it is that when you're not standing in the sweet spot and you have a big planet mm. that should look circular, it will not be a circle. 
it'll be basically be an egg shaped thing, ellipsoidal, something if you're it has to be perspective wise. If you render something from a particular perspective. Yes, but we so okay, so in the case of the Worldwide Telescope, we're not rendering it. You are. It's coming directly from Fair enough. But but the experience, I guess what mm. I'm trying to say. Well that that's know. that is an interesting problem. Um, uh, we uh, at this stage, have tested it across in, the, in that space and put it up and, and had the planet in the middle, you know, where the wedge is, because we're concerned about that look. And so far, it seems okay. We've still got to do a bit more. Maybe it's a s scale, but um, it looks okay. And I think the important thing is nobody seems to mind, particularly when it, the stars, obviously, it doesn't matter, but the planets, we're going to play with a bit more, see how it looks, yeah. What's really interesting with the REAP one is it, it's, it's an inherently multi scale. Um, data set. Like, it, it plays hmm. really well with how you get a big space on top yeah. Yeah. and the small space at the bottom and you can get all the details in the small space and all the interaction yeah. in the small yeah. space. And actually because how you can interact with the well to get information on the well, yeah. that's another question. I think it's, it really plays well with your... And I wonder if the Worldwide Telescope or the examples of hmm. you actually play that well with being able to have a, a uh, information space that's has a lot of density, a lot of detail at the bottom, mm. and you can play on the idea of scale on top. Mm. Uh, mm. It seems like that. Yeah, well, that's something interesting for us to explore. I mean, we, we've got this as said, the near and far experience. So with the Worldwide Telescope, we, we want to keep it as reasonably far as possible because that's what you want to look at. But when you come near, we haven't yet decided with with the solar sky we're going to give people local information and they'll do stuff there and that'll just be like a really big screen in in front of you and and up there will just be a tour running or or, or something so we could also play with things like you know having having the outline of a planet let's say even earth mm. looking out that people can track with earth mm. in perspective to the rest of the world for instance like you can play on that on that idea of you know, you're you're looking at something that's really close, but mm. you have a vision uh, to something really far, mm. Mm. Uh, which which is sort of what you're doing here. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm you know I think so. What we've done, the testing we've done, and we, we uh, we've also done that um, NASA. We we ran up the NASA project, you know, the moon landing. You know, they got all that video, and we we had that running one afternoon just, and that also looked fine. It's great at that scale. I mean, essentially, you've got a cinema problem except and you've got this blended thing in the middle I mean we, we, we were concerned even with the reef that when the you know the whale swims across that blend so what we've done is made the behavior so that it doesn't <laughs> but the whale shark despite uh, things does sometimes go across the middle but it nobody seems to you know because it's not actually uh, 90 degrees I should say it's 110 slightly opened out um, yeah, it, it seems to be right. We did experiment with an, what's called anamorphic projection, where you can flatten a, a, a... So if you project into that corner, and we did develop this one of my honours students, project into that three plane there, and it reads as if it's a flat plane. We, we did do that, but we didn't, then we found we didn't really need to. In fact, it had an odd effect on the reef because it made it, made it just look wrong, oddly enough when you flattened it. Because as you say, it's all water and, and you're fading off into the distance anyway with water. And then if you flatten the, the it just looked odd, oddly. So. I also sometimes wonder if we get more critical about those issues than sometimes the general public does, right? It, I find that sometimes and even when we do some of the WWT stuff on the projection work, I, we notice all the little cracks and everything. Yeah. We yes. Well, I, I guess the, the reason why I asked that question is because I found for a lot of these experiences that the sweet spot, they, there's always a sweet yeah. spot, but the sweet spot is fairly large and public is very yes. forgiving. Yeah. Uh, I think it, we, we benefit from years of being trained of going to the cinema, see, seeing movies off axis, mm. yeah. which, yeah. which we're perfectly, our yep, brain yep. is perfectly fine to adopt yeah. and, and you don't really notice it after a while. So I think the same phenomena probably goes in these experiences. They're fundamentally wrong but they are believable enough. Yeah, I, I think you're actually right. So even despite all the, the fiddling we did and all the subtle variations to the, it probably made no difference. You know, we weren't, we didn't actually do any real experimentation where we tested it other than we did it by eye in our development lab, which wasn't that scale when we did it. We had four panels and then we had eight and we played with it and we made some decisions. But you're probably right, it probably makes no difference at all. It's just very forgiving in that environment. As you say, people just, 
and also the nature of this the reef is is not you know you don't have strong perspective lines of like a building or a city streetscape or something so it's it's probably much less forgiving um, <coughs> so much more forgiving and also you're right people even if it looked odd people would still forgive you it's like when you take a photograph and buildings lean in when you look you know that that effect of perspective you know we we suspend disbelief we accept that the buildings aren't really leaning in we just take it for granted because we spend so much of our life looking at those sorts of images these days. It might, it might uh, have an impact in some of the stated goals that you have said if you're look, actually looking at the data set where lines matter, mm -hmm. where connections matter, mm -hmm. when, when looking at patterns, things like that, all this perspective stuff starts coming back in because then it, you're basically fooling people and they have to be standing in the sweet spot. Yes, yes. That, so we created a bunch of these different things like the, the telescope in the dome and, and once you start showing you know link graphs and start doing information visualization mm. and where the nodes and the straight yeah. lines are there and connections between stuff that's here and there, uh, I yeah. think people in your setup will, unless you keep it all planar, I think it's going to be very difficult to, to I yeah, mean, yeah. I'm not sure. as easy as some things like I'm this. I'm sure you're right, yes. I mean at the moment we've just dealt with this big open you space. It's a very good yeah. uh, scene for this yeah. one. This well, is a great scene for That's that. right, and, and, and I think the telescope will be fine too. And we're doing stuff which is coming, turning around the telescope, coming back to Earth, and then blending when we get closer with, with this um, laser distance and that LIDAR data that we've got from the military for, for looking at uh, remote areas and so on. And so, so, but again, it's the scale of that perspective doesn't seem to matter too much. I think once you've got straight lines, yes, you do get a problem. It'd be interesting yeah. to see if you, let's say, you try to get the, use the Kinect or any kind of sensor to, to try to see where the groups are. Let's say it's like one major group and you just slightly change to the point of view that main camera drives <laughs> the projectors to adjust to adjust to where people are. We, this is something I, I uh, explore. I mean, we have, got, we have got the laser detectors sitting in the, the uh, middle of the wedge and the two edges and then back under the stair. We don't particularly use it, but we can detect where, that there is someone there and how many. We haven't done anything with that yet, but it was, it's there. And I haven't come up with a reason to use it, but maybe with the connect uh, movement things and then knowing that there's five or six or you know, 10 people, um, then we can perhaps start to do things. I'm keen to make that space in there sort of in front of an active space, but I don't know how to do it. You have a strongly like a point of view where it's a, a sweet spot, right? People yeah. will tend to actually go there. Mm -hmm. So you could like there's a mutually beneficial relationship. Like we can enforce yeah. that reaction as well by having the point of view slightly changing yeah. depending where yeah. people are. Yeah. They'll, they'll tend to go where it actually happens. Well, so if we get the lasers strong enough, we can have it so they move out. They get you know shut down. <laughs> <laughs> it's the gamer in me, you know. Exactly. Maybe I missed it in the beginning. Yeah. You said, uh, can you, you, you mind sharing some of the details on like how many people work on this and how much did this whole thing cost? Okay, so the physical kit cost about five million dollars all up. Um, the, with people, it come came closer to seven. Um, there was a lot of discussion, and two two years out, we opened at the beginning of this year. Um, it was extend in October last year and then we did all this testing and, and further development and, we, and my team worked in the new building before it was sort of officially open, they made a room for us, getting all the networking going and all the rest of it. There's a network room above which has got, which has got all the machines in it, you know, the double cool thing, lots of cables running everywhere. You can go in behind this, there's a, a walk space about shoulder width that you can go in behind because you have to get to all sorts of things. Um, so for the reef, I had six people. So there was two coders, C coders. There was two uh, animators, modelers, and there was a couple of people who were on, on the specialists on, on reef and fish ecology and, and so on. And there was uh, uh, someone whose job was to make sure we coordinated with the research people and the museum people, got them there occasionally, and they vetted what we did. No, those fish don't bend in the middle. They bend at the tail, all this sort of stuff. So we got all the behaviors correct. Um, so we had external collaborators and we had those team. About a dozen of the species were outsourced initially to China, came back and then we spent some time fixing them up and adding more stuff and, and so on. We, we were hoping to get a lot of this, either buy them in 
or have them pre-made, but that didn't work out so well because some of the stuff we got back was not well good enough for what we needed and, and so on. Plus we had to put all the AI, all the behaviours of everything in. So doing the model was only half of the job. Um, with the physics playroom, uh, there was essentially two people on that. There was Andrew, uh, who spends his entire life standing up his computer um, coding, and he has one of his doctoral students from Australian National University helping him. Uh, there was an energy project called ECOS, which I didn't show, which looks at the energy of the building and has live feeds and whatever. There was about four people on that. Um, the History Wall project had initially m myself and two interns from Singapore, and then we had two other coders on it and eventually just one. Oh, and a video specialist guy. So for the, for the read, uh, you said six people. Did yeah. that include... Did you start from having a kind of a distribution, distributed display figured out, or did that include all the kind of infrastructure of, of the networking and blending and all that kind of stuff? When we started, it was literally, you know, just a screen, let's make this 3D world a virtual reef. And then as we got the kit, as we got the early versions of the panels, we had them set up in, the, in the, our, our development space and we sort of put it across a a space like that and that high and just see what it looked like but we we didn't have the projectors and then we got some projectors and there's a whole lot of that and there was certainly was a point where we were waiting for the whole thing to be built and there was this moment of oh is it going to look all right because we didn't know what it would look like at that scale and whether that corner would be a problem whether this resolutions would be a problem and so on so yeah there was a bit of uh, you know uh, bit of hit and miss there along the way. It was fairly iterative. There was a, a lot of the work was just getting, putting more species into the environment, getting the behaviours working. You wouldn't have noticed it, but oddly, by the end of the day, most of the fish have distributed everywhere because everybody's touching the things and doing things and that causes them to flee or to do something else. And by the end of the day, they're just out of their zones. You know, the, the little um, clownfish are supposed to be near the anemone. They, they, that's where they start. But So it's an interesting effect of people, if you like, interacting with this huge aquarium, that the fish just almost evenly distribute, which causes a problem because as the sharks come through, then they all run away again. So it's, it's odd. And we have zones where fish would normally live and stay, but then they end up being pushed out of that. So there's some odd things we could tweak in terms of what really happens. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it was a fairly iterative process, but a lot of it was just about getting the content up, getting the the coral in and, 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 and rendered was a big issue because it just takes so much grunt to get all those tiny little, and we had to experiment with how much detail we needed and all of that usual thing for a graphic display. And how, how long did it take? 18 months. 18 months. Mm. For the reef, uh, some of the other projects took less time. The data wall took maybe six months. A lot of that was the interaction issues um, and then until we had the kit, configured we didn't know how much we could do so there was still some evolution at, even as we opened and so on but the reef was the main opening event and so there was a lot of effort to make sure that worked and, and so on a lot of tension and <laughs> concern but, uh. also there's projections on the back side so they also have spaces on the back let me just see if we got so well so they have the big one the wedge and then that's the wedge, but there's the other side walls. That's on one of the walls, the physics play space. Did, were you here for that one? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah they're actually computer image, they're computer, um, yeah. So that's, you walk in the door, that's what you see, the beginning of it, and around the other, around the side of that is the, is the, uh, the roof. So it's a very public space and, and, it, and it runs, it's been pretty seamless, it's been running all this time without any fault. Occasionally a panel, we, we've had to recalibrate uh, the panels uh, a couple of times um, and there have been some firmware updates to the panels and so on, but they do that out, out, out of hours. So it's running from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. usually and we have to keep it running from 10 to 4 because that's when the school groups come in or visitors or whatever. And the Vice Chancellor loves taking international people through here. I also wondered about the one where you got the multiple displays for the pe anyone to connect mm. into. So mm. is it that one or? That, that one. one. There's projectors there that yeah. you can connect to. Um, and 
this one as well, but you're bit, with a bit of setup through the, the cube team. Okay. So, because you need to get it through to the server to come back onto these screens. So, this is where some of my students try out some of their games if they, if they have a game that makes sense on this environment. This one um, doesn't require permission, although we try to vet it as much as possible. So, what, what is the? I'm sorry, I missed the one. Sorry, that, that's on the upper level. So, there's the, the wedge to the story, and then both sides, and then both sides. And so, on the bottom, it's it's standard and above we've got that and then on the other wall we've just got projectors blended and sit just to the left of that image are these bench seats at uh, cube seats and students sit there all day this whole space I should say is, is really inhabited by students it's just full if you don't my son who goes to the this university complains if he doesn't get there by nine o'clock in the morning he can't find anywhere to sit and work I mean it's it's a really good public space and students love it and uh, and you can see them sitting there in the spaces. They just, um, this was a recently when there's not too many, but there's always students around. How, what will become of this when you run out of funding? I don't think we'll ever run out of funding for, for just keeping it ticking over because it's a vice chancellor's project and so, and it's, and it's got so much interest. So it'll always be a bit of an icon there. I, the issue is the resources to put new content on, which is always under, undervalued and under-resourced. And everyone complains that the kit costs $5 million. And so, well, yeah, but for all the content you got for $1.5 million. And I was just seconded from my faculty. You know, so, so there was a lot of embedded costs there that no one added up. We had, you know, my six team were all uh, separately contracted for that period and paid, you know. Nothing more heartbreaking than seeing some, something that was awesome 10 years ago, but just died, you know. Like the Information table. Environments Program. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, like especially interactive, you know, things that you go to a museum and, you know, you're like, you can tell it used to be awesome, but it's been sort of left well, to decay and it's, you know, you like... Well, see, see uh, interestingly, the Queensland Museum has this reef project running just as a projection, which has one-fifth of that area on a wall and an and a iPad as a bit of a control. So, so it, you know, it could be in other places if you had some interaction. It just, and it's just got one uh, server running it, just one image on the wall, one projection. Um, but I, I doubt that it'll ever be, I mean, who knows, 10 years away. But right now, it will continue to be maintained at the very least. Just replacing the projector globes, you know, that's, so there'll be a, uh, an evolution into the, the full LED projectors and things like that when they can get them bright enough and so on. But, for the moment, yeah. There's a team of three, I should say, whose job is technically just to keep it running and they're contracted. And, and then the other one was the um, your interaction where you can log in through your swipes. Mm, yep. You didn't show actually kind of what what it what you would see, but is it is just limited to those types of documents or? At the moment, it's so so the, it's called you know it's Qubit and you can look it up. Okay. And you can, I think you may not get access if you're not a QT staff member, but. Uh, uh, because of the thing about data and stuff, but if you are and, or a student, then you have your own space. You can upload. It's like Dropbox yeah. essentially, and and, and and in fact, there is a connection to Dropbox and also the university's um, uh, shared data area. Yeah. It the software only will run a text file, PDF, PPT, and uh, .mov or um, MP3. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, there is an intention to do other things. There's also the ongoing project, which is to get that same software into all our lecture theatres. Yeah. So I could come up here with this touch panel, swipe, and then, yeah. which I think is, why not? You know, like, yeah, exactly. in fact, that was why I got involved with the project, because I was pushing that for some time, because I, this exercise seems a bit oddly primitive. Yeah. I mean, if you live here, you should be able to <laughs> bring it up. So I'd like that, because these are all touch panels. We have the same in our, all our lecture theatres. You touch them to control the thing, but that seems a bit pr primitive. And <coughs> why not actually have that that qubit exercise? And I just pull out the PPT, and I can swipe this, and <coughs> I don't have to carry this between lectures. You know. There's a few things as well, though. Um, having people make hypotheses. You know, so you go back to the reef experiment, making hypotheses, like engaging students more in an active <coughs> problem solving. And yeah. Inference making. Well, okay. So level. I'm involved in another project called the chemistry wall, and that is. You know, again, university chemistry, first year chemis chemistry, but 
um, there is a, a design where at each of the individual panels I can be doing some chemistry and it's one stage in the industrial process and then I can bring it over into the next person who's going to do their bits of it and so on. So we've got some ideas about how you can actually engender more understanding um, and basically chemistry tutorials in that sort of realistic, as if you've got a chemistry bench sort of thing. You know, you pull things over and you touch things and you mix things and whatever, and you see the uh, molecule above and so on. So that, that it's ongoing, that's almost, it's been prototyped and beaded and we're just waiting to develop that one up. So that'll be there soon as well. The interesting thing about all of that is that the, the three technicians who run it and make sure everything's working and if the panel switches off, they switch it on again sort of thing. And if there's calibration or something, but the, all of those apps we've got, we've got on a pad and they come sometimes sitting there and they just touch things at the vice chances and they can and just, with, you know, it just shuts down everything, brings up the next thing. So the, the reef takes about two minutes to load up and all the things that happen. And so we had to write a, an app that brings these curtains across <laughs> and pulls them back again. So when the vice chancellor there doesn't have all that weird uh, computer speak zipping up on the screen. <clears throat> but literally we can switch any app to any zone off this iPad app and we just and the technicians are there doing it and testing it. So they go downstairs and they, they do it. Um, so that, that was one of the things we had to do, the whole command and control. And we've got one server whose job is just doing that. For the clarification, yeah. to be on the telescope, um, is there any Microsoft dialogue happening with you? <laughs> Are you talking to Microsoft Australia? Are you talking to uh, large screen people? Uh, a little bit. Uh, mostly we've gone directly to, to you guys here. Um, but there's been a little bit through John Warren. He affected the initial introductions. And he works, he's, yes, yes, and he works with one of my colleagues, Paul Rowe, who's uh, doing the, he does the Microsoft E-Research Centre for us. So, uh, so yeah. But not, not like Jeff Hahn with the Centre Pixel. No, no, no. Or Ben Cohen. Basically, this I don't know where this came from, but one one day uh, my uh, my dean says, Michael, I need you to do this, and uh, and then Paul said, and I'll introduce you to John, who's going to get you connected to these people, and then you've got to go and see them, and so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> but it's an exciting project because I'm really interested in exploring these interaction ideas, and this content is going to let me do some of that. So I'm, I'm and there is we've got we've got. The team, so we've got our e-research uh, called e-visualisation team, and there's four people in that, two, of, three of whom are top code people. So we've got a team of people, and we've got some more money if I need to bring in a C person or something like that. Very interesting. Mm. So I I work on pen, and there's a lot of benefits to pen, mm. especially in the case yeah. of scenarios. So yeah. it'd be really interesting to see if you can introduce that, especially because the technology doesn't seem to be that far away. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'm interested in exploring all the levels of interaction. I said all this space down here would be great if I could use that in some way. And I, we did do some, there is, a, there is an app I got one of my students to do which, which allows you to touch your phone and, and, it, and it, it interacts there. We've just never released it. Yeah, uh, it'd be great to explore some of these, these ideas for interaction. Thanks. Well, I'm. Um, chance. I don't know if you're familiar with the Holosphere project down in a University of yep. California, Santa Barbara. It's a four-story, humongous. It looks like the the thing from the X-Men. Yeah. It's a four-story, humongous sphere, spherical display with I think 18 4K projectors. Oh wow. Uh, including all sorts of weird, uh, and by weird I mean awesome. Uh, Spatial acoustic audio, mm. right? The, 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 the sphere itself is kind of translucent material with little holes, so it, audio carries very well. They have lots of spatialist audio and things like that. Wow. They're going all nuts in, in all sorts of large scale, large immersive kind yeah, of yeah, uh, experience yeah. uh, visualizations. Well, um, that, that is interesting to me. I mean, what, what do we do with these spaces? You know, we, it, they have the same question, they have the same yeah. problem, so yeah. you guys might have a lot of stuff to. Uh, and, and, and how legitimate is it? I mean, like you can do all these things, but then you don't really test whether that's 
a good or bad thing. It's just, just how it is, you know. And so there's a push between the sort of the PR. I mean, I, I, the interaction and the design of this is about a third of what I had on the table to start with. We didn't go a lot of the ways I wanted to go with this, uh, just for whole lots of reasons. So there's lots more we could do with this, even as it is. And I don't think we really understand large scale touch interaction, even, even with the tables. I mean, at the moment you can, you, know, you can get a couple of people, but it's just, it's got to evolve. You know, we, it, now we don't think twice about using a, a pad or a surface, you know, we just, but three years ago, it just wasn't there. So I, I think we just, you know, we use new technology in old ways until we get used to it. So, you know, waiting to see. I, I, to some extent, what we're doing with this technology is almost trivial. <laughs> Uh, but it wasn't set up to be a research thing. We do have a research centre uh, a couple of floors above this where we've got, you know, four of those like that and then another four the other way. We've got the 3D planar system. We've got the gesture G-Speak system. We've got a bunch of things in there where we do our research and we've got masters and PhD students doing projects and that's where they do it. And if it gets to a point where <coughs> it needs this scale, then we can put it up here. But <coughs> So we are I'm trying to get... I mean, I did for a while have one of those screens in front of me, and here's my keyboard, and that was my monitor, <laughs> just to see what that meant for you, the way you behaved. I mean, I didn't have, I only had it for a few months, but it just changes how you think about the data that you're using because it's like this digital desktop. I mean, you just stop using the keyboard, and you, it is a bit overwhelming. But it's not well supporting that kind of tonight. No, not really. Cheers. So. We're probably done, are we? Yeah. We're done. Good. <laughs>